Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And today, I'm joined by Dr. Holly Peterson. Holly, can you tell everybody who you are? I'm the director of medical breast services at Cleveland Clinic, and I run the High Risk Breast Center. OK, so let's start with, as healthcare practitioners, the, the confusion and, and some help here in terms of screening and what guidelines are for screening women in their 40s, women in their 50s. Let's first talk about average risk women. So for average risk women, it has become quite confusing and the guidelines uh, are very different from one another. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, and the American College of Radiology, ACR, still recommend starting at the age of 40 and having annual mammography until you're not healthy anymore. Uh, the American Cancer Society, ACOG, the American Academy of Family Practice, have all, have all undergone permutations of, of these guidelines. The USPSTF came out several years ago suggesting that women start at age 50 right. and go every other year until 74. All the other societies are somewhere in between. And, and for Canada, that, that too is 50 every two years up until the age of 74. Between the ages of 40 to 50, it's a case-by-case -case collaborative decision between the healthcare provider and the patient. This can be quite confusing. Well, and shared decision-making is so important between 40 and 50, but the problem is that 75% of breast cancers that are diagnosed are in women that don't have any family history or right. identifiable risk factors. And particularly, if you don't have a baseline mammogram and know your breast density, it's very difficult to have uh, a, an informed decision about screening mammography. There's a 20 to 40% mortality reduction across the board, and that hasn't changed. Okay. So then let's talk about other modalities of screening, not genetics yet, we'll get there, sure. but in terms of ultrasound and MRI, particularly for women who are identified as having a dense breast. And all women should know what their breast density is. Women who have heterogeneously dense tissue or extremely dense tissue are deemed dense, and they account for about 45 to 50% of all women. In the US, all women are now being notified about their density. And the supplemental screening uh, modalities that are available include three-dimensional mammography right. or digital breast tomosynthesis, which adds an additional 25% sensitivity with 15% fewer callbacks. But in absolute terms, that only amounts to 1.5 extra cancers detected per thousand women screened. The supplemental yield of whole breast ultrasound is four cancers per thousand women screened, but there are a lot of false positives. Right. And MRI, the full sequence, which has typically been reserved for the highest risk women with a supplemental yield of 25 cancers per thousand women screened, the new uh, modality on the block is the, the FAST MRI, or abbreviated MRI, which in meta-analyses has been shown to have similar sensitivity and specificity to the full sequence MRI, and is available at many centers out of pocket for a very low cost. So in my opinion, having three-dimensional mammography and considering Fast MRI, if you can find it, every three years, just for an average risk, dense woman, would be my recommendation. Okay, so now let's move on, and we're still talking about the general population, not, not women who have already been diagnosed with a breast cancer or a DCIS. Where do you begin to talk about genetic screening? genetic screening and risk assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, women start to think about it, you know, in their 40s and 50s, and they need to be thinking about it in their 20s and 30s. In Ashkenazi women and in black women, really, they should all have a risk assessment before the age of 30. And when we say risk assessment, are we talking about 
their family history? What are we talking about in that assessment? A careful assessment? family history is really probably the most important thing at that age. Mm -hmm. They will not know what their breast density is. They will not have had atypical breast biopsies. D really going into that family history for early onset breast cancers, ovarian cancer at any age, male breast cancers, bilateral breast cancers, triple negative breast cancers, if we can raise the awareness in women who are 25 to 30, we're going to pick up a lot more carriers and avoid this diagnosis of early onset cancer in young women. So when does a healthcare practitioner have the discussion about doing not only BRCA, but all the newer genes, check genes, all the genes that we have now you know, come up over the last few years in terms of doing a genetic profile? Sure. So a woman can legally in our country have testing at the age of 18, and really we've moved almost exclusively to gene panel testing. Unless there's a known, identified, highly penetrant gene mutation in the family and you're doing single site testing, for the most part we do gene panel testing, but I, I encourage young women to consider waiting until they're 25. Uh, we wouldn't begin MRI screening until that point anyway, and it can be very overwhelming. And for an average, with an average risk who doesn't have a family history, that's a different situation. That's a different situation. Y you know, there are direct-to-consumer tests available, which for the most part, the only test for the three most common mutations seen in the Ashkenazi population, the founder mutations, right. there are direct-to-consumer next-generation panel tests, but I, I wouldn't really recommend that for women without family history because it can open a can of worms that may not necessarily be, need, be, you know, be necessary to open. So let's move on to breast cancer prevention, meaning women without an identifiable a DCIS or a cancer, where would you consider prophylactic therapy? So for all women, we want to really be aware of maintaining our ideal body weight, limiting alcohol consumption, and considering limiting the duration of combined hormone therapy in the postmenopausal period, particularly in women with dense breasts. Um, but I think that you're referring more for preventive medication yes. and preventive surgery. Those are women who have compelling family history, mother and sister, particularly diagnosed at an early age, in combination with other risk factors such as breast density. Women who have benign breast biopsies like atypical hyperplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ. Women who have had mantle radiation for Hodgkin's disease prior to the age of 30. And certainly gene carriers uh, who are predisposed to estrogen sensitive breast cancers. Those are the ones we want to target. And the USPSTF has set forth a threshold at which the benefits likely outweigh the risks for preventive medication. And using the Gale model, that's a five-year estimate of 3% or greater. ASCO uses the Tyracusic model, 10-year risk of 5% or greater. And that's the point at which the benefits likely outweigh the risks. So those thresholds, atypical hyperplasia and LCIS, and the gene carriers that are predisposed, and potentially thoracic radiation uh, survivors. So in general, for, for our practitioners who are seeing perimenopausal women and menopausal women, where should they start in terms of opening up the door of conversation? What should we be asking women before we make the decision about mammograms or any other adjunctive tests? I think, you know, first of all, look at your survivors and make sure that they had appropriate genetic testing. If they tested before the fall of 2013, they only had bracket right. testing and not panel. They may want to return for panel testing. And in women who were diagnosed under the age of 50 or who have remaining dense breast tissue, 
uh, consider annual MRI screening. So that's, I think, where you would start, you know, in the practice is looking at the women who have already had breast cancer. And then we all have to find ways within our practice to identify high-risk carriers, both those with hereditary syndromes and those with familial clustering, so that we can offer them enhanced surveillance and preventive medication. Risk-reducing surgery is really reserved for those at the highest level of risk. The ones with the highly penetrant gene mutations, BRCA1, BRCA2, P10, P53, PALB2, and CDH1. Women with compelling family history, and that's difficult to define, but you know it when you see it. Right. And it can be considered in women with prior thoracic irradiation. So I think it, it's critical for us to be able to have sort of these silos where you say, and for those that do not have that history, that family history, but somewhere between the ages of 45 and 50 coming to see you, mm -hmm. what should they know about their breast care? And I love when they come, and I love when the young ones come, but when the perimenopausal women come, they should know their breast density, know their family history, but let's say it's average, and let's say they're heterogeneously dense, as are 40% right. of women. We need to focus on lifestyle, focus on appropriate screening, and, and really make them aware of supplemental screening that's available to them. I think that just raising the awareness around ruling out genetic issues and focusing on appropriate screening is, is, and lifestyle is, is the way to go in an average, healthy woman. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me.